All right, let's uh, bring into the conversation our special guest joining us, civil rights attorney, former Court TV anchor, my former co-anchor, Lisa Bloom, back with us, and criminal defense attorney, civil rights attorney, also former Court TV anchor, anchor uh, Ron Kuby. Um, Lisa, um, it, what do you think, all of the testimony about the drugs here, what's going on? Is, is this the foundation for the arguments regarding cause of death, or is this uh, going to be used to attempt to undermine and assassinate the character of the victim, George Floyd? Well, the defense is clearly victim blaming and trying to make George Floyd out to be this scary, terrible drug user. And so it was very smart for the prosecution to preempt all of that by putting on a very sympathetic witness, the girlfriend, to talk about her own struggles with opioid addiction and George Floyd's struggles with opioid addiction. And you know, who among us doesn't know somebody who struggles with addiction if we don't have that struggle ourselves? So I think it was a very smart move by the prosecution to preempt all of that, to humanize him. Yes, he may have had some struggles, but he's still a human being who was obviously very much loved by his girlfriend. I, I think this was just a home run for the prosecution today. Rob, what's the impact of the, the testimony and evidence regarding George Floyd and his struggles with drugs? Uh, from my perspective today, uh, I agree with everything that's been said. This witness was incredibly sympathetic. She painted a, a picture of a joint struggle to overcome addiction with its high points and, and its low points. Of course, I'm old enough to remember a time in the 80s and 90s when crack addiction, which was primarily a, a problem in the in the African-American urban communities, was thought of as a sign of grave moral weakness. And crack addicts were, were thought of people who would murder their own mothers for two dollars. Once the opioid crisis hit us, which is still primarily uh, a, a, an affliction of the white communities, it suddenly has become medicalized, and now we're all sympathetic to to people who are struggling with substance abuse. That that's a step forward, uh, and, and I think it's fantastic. So I don't think the drug issue is going to have any effect on this jury because, as Lisa said, we all know, and certainly everybody on that jury knows somebody who struggled with substance abuse. Now, another part of the testimony of Courtney Ross was about the relationship with George Floyd. Um, let's take a listen to that testimony because that, again, gives a, a different picture of, of the man who is the victim in this case. Miss Ross, did you know um, George Floyd? Yes. When did you meet George Floyd? I met Floyd in August of 2017. And you refer to him as Floyd? All the time. And so what, when was it that you first met Mr. Floyd? May I tell the story? Sure. Okay. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories to tell. I was pretty upset. And I started kind of fussing in the corner of the lobby. And uh, at one point, So it came up to me. And uh, Floyd has this great, deep, southern voice, raspy. And he's like, sis, you OK, sis? And I wasn't OK. I said, no, I'm, I'm just waiting for my son's father. <laughs> Sorry. He said, um, I said, well, can I pray with you? I thought I was so tired. We had been through so much, my sons and I. And this kind person just to come up to me and say, can I pray with you? When I felt alone in this lobby, it was so sweet. <laughs> Afterwards, um, he had asked me who my son's father was. 
and I said, you know, we're, we're, we're co-parent and we're, um, we're not in a relationship. And that's when his, I like to say his voice dropped like two levels, even though it was deep already. And he, he asked me um, if he could get my number and we had our first kiss in the lobby. And that's when our relationship started. Um, up until his death, did you continue to be in a relationship with him? Yes. Can you describe, you know, how, how close you, how often you saw each other during those three years? Uh, just about every day we saw each other, as much as we possibly could. You and Floyd, Mr. Floyd, excuse me, I'm assuming like most couples had pet names for each other. Yeah. And what was his name for you? I mean, what were you saved? Let me strike that. What were you saved in his phone as? Mama. Julie Janae, Court TV legal correspondent in Minneapolis. Um, I just want to start with that last part there from the cross examination. Um, it seemed that was she seemed reluctant, or how, how did you read her response to that question? Well, I just think that she felt sad remembering what he used to say to her. That's the demeanor she had throughout when she really seemed to think back on him or see his picture. But you could tell that the defense attorney was trying to insinuate that perhaps the mama that we hear on the video, that he's not talking to her. But later in that cross-examination, uh, she that he's not talking to his own mother, rather, uh, she says that, look, he called me mama, but in a different way. That was a pet name. He, she could tell when he was talking about his mother's. I don't think uh, Nelson scored any points trying to make that insinuation, but uh, she did seem sad talking about things that were very personal about their relationship. But again, seemed like a very genuine witness. Yeah. Lisa, this was a, a much different picture that the jury will get of George Floyd, right? We've got all these videos, and, and that's a, a horrendous day. He's in pain. He's in handcuffs, all of that. Here we got to hear what George Floyd was like on other days, you know, the, 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 and now the rest of the story. Yes, absolutely. And she is a magnificent witness. If I'm the prosecutor, I want her to stay on the stand as long as possible. I am surprised the defense asked her any questions at all. The defense should have stood up and said, thank you. I'm sorry for your loss. Goodbye. Next witness. There's no nothing to be gained from cross-examining her. I also thought it was very interesting in the first part of the clip that you just showed how she kind of went on and on with her story, which from a storytelling point of view was very good. From a trial point of view, you know, witnesses are not supposed to do that. They're not supposed to testify in a narrative. It's very uncomfortable for the defense, I think, to object. I wonder if the judge kind of gave the prosecutor a look, and that's why he said, uh, you know, let me let me jump in and, and ask you something, if I may. It's very difficult when you have a witness who does that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ron Kuby, at least makes a great point about uh, how the defense sort of sitting back, not wanting to uh, disrupt what she was saying, but a lot of what she was saying uh, is incredibly helpful to prosecutors, and I think mm -hmm. kind of unusual in, in, a, in a case like this. We've seen a lot of unusual things uh, in the George Floyd murder case, and, and that's right. Generally, you would not uh, permit a witness to go on at this length and in this depth with things that are really not really central to the issue of, of whether or not Chauvin is guilty or, 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 or will be found not guilty. Uh, so it's not the first we've seen of that. It won't be the last. But, but I think we sort of misunderstand what a defense win is here. I, I think everybody watching this case believes it is extremely unlikely that the jury will acquit Chauvin on all counts. So what does a defense win look like? A defense win is either a mistrial with some time so Chauvin can take a plea or a conviction on the least serious count of second degree manslaughter, which requires a finding of, of culpable criminal negligence and inherently dangerous acts. Uh, and if you want to think that's a prosecutorial win, you can. But given the sentencing guidelines, Chauvin gets convicted of that. Um, he gets uh, he ends up doing about two and a half years and he's back out on the street. That's the big win. So if the defense can get that, that's a huge win. Absolutely. Way to put everything in perspective.
Julie Janae, I know you're going to uh, rejoin us in, in a little bit. Thank you so much. Uh, Lisa and Ron are going to stay with us when we come back. Other big moments uh, from today in Minneapolis. You have idea? No, I don't. My name's Shawana Hill. Sir. I just came over to get my phone. See, I don't have a purse or nothing. And my daughter is on her way to get me. What's his deal? I don't know. That's my ex. I don't know. Hey, Mr. Adam knows me, sir. That's my ex. I don't know. All right, that's Maurice Hall and Shawanda Hill. Those are the two other passengers in George Floyd's Mercedes on, on the day at Cup Foods. Now, they came up during the testimony today of George Floyd's girlfriend, um, and she is not too crazy about them. Take a listen to what she had to say about the two passengers that were with George Floyd the day he died. Did you uh, know Mr. Floyd to spend a lot of time with Mr. Maurice Hall? I wouldn't say a lot of time, but he spent time with him, yes. Right. And um, would you agree that, that that was kind of from time to time that he would spend time with him? Yes. Um, and you didn't like that, did you? Excuse me, I didn't like Maurice very much, no. Would Mr. Um, Mr. Floyd be honest with you when he told you that he, when he was with him? I'm going to object your honor's characterization. Uh, all three members. That is sustained. You don't have to answer that one. Yeah. You, you knew Mr. Floyd would purchase narcotics from Mr. Reese or Maurice Hall? I don't know that. I, I speculated that. Do you recall the FBI agents asking you, did Mr. Floyd purchase controlled substances from Mr. Maurice Hall? Yes. And do you recall saying yes? I did say yes, but I did not see it with my own eyes. At this point. All on the answers. Okay. Now, the the pills that were purchased in March that you described. Yeah. Did you did you know that those were purchased from Mr. Hall? What what um. The pills that you described in March of 2020. No, I didn't know. But those are the pills that kept you up, uh, you said, all night, right? Yeah. Did those pills continue to be around from March through May? I don't know. Do you recall the FBI asking whether you were getting those same pills uh, from the same source from March to May? I don't recall that question. Would it refresh your rec recollection to review a transcript? Yes. yes. Would you agree with me that the FBI agents asked you from March to May if you continued to purchase those pills from the same source? Did they ask you that question? They yes. did. And you responded well, once in a while when we were desperate. Agreed? That's what it says, yes. I don't recall saying that. I'm going to object is non-responsive. Okay. Overruled. No, you were asked a couple of questions in terms of uh, whether that overdose was caused by heroin. Do you recall that? Yes. And you said you didn't know. I didn't. Do you remember telling the FBI that the overdose was from heroin? I was speculating. Do you recall telling the FBI where or whom the source of that heroin was. Once again, yes, I do remember that, but I was speculating. And was that Mr. Hall? No. Was that Shawanda Hill? Yes. All right, Lisa Bloom, Ron Kuby, still with us tonight. Um, Ron, to me, this was a, a pretty powerful for the defense. Now, all of a sudden, you've got George Floyd the day he died with two people whose girlfriend doesn't like, two people whose girlfriend thinks and told the FBI was supplying him with drugs. 
Yeah, I mean, but what does it actually mean in terms of some sort of defense theory? It, we've already He's in a tailspin. Discovered. He's in a tailspin, he, and this is the he, day he overdoses. Well, you see, he clearly was using again, and if you're using again, you're getting your drugs from somewhere. And th the trouble with the overdose argument as an actual argument is the very point the family attorneys made, that, that just minutes before the nine minutes and 29 seconds, he was having a pretty nice active time inside the grocery store. He was dancing around and talking and he looked just fine. So I, I think it's going to be hard to make any realistic argument that the cause of death, the legal proximate cause of death was a drug overdose rather than, than uh, Chauvin's knee on his neck. Lisa Bloom, let me ask you, you know, the, the amount of fentanyl in the system was uh, potentially lethal. It was a lot. You have a medical examiner for Hennepin County who, uh, in an interview, told someone that if there were no other facts around this case, he would be comfortable ruling this an overdose. And now you've got George Floyd hanging out with two people that his girlfriend doesn't like, two people that his girlfriend suspects and told the FBI supplied him with drugs. I don't care if he's hanging out with the devil himself. I don't care if he's shooting up drugs five seconds before Chauvin got his knee locked on his neck. We saw in the video what happened. We saw minutes going by where George Floyd was pleading for his life because of the knee on his neck, not because of drugs in his system. We see him go limp. The knee stays there. Clearly, the knee was the cause of death. I, I find it just so disturbing that this argument is even being made, given what we all saw on that video. And I sure hope the jury doesn't buy it. Well, I want to play one more um, piece of testimony from today. This was Sergeant Pluger. He was the sergeant on duty that day. He responds to the scene. Um, and he, on the stand, was, was, was giving an opinion sort of as an expert based upon uh, his experience. Very significant moment. Let's watch. Based on your review of the body-worn camera footage, uh, do you have an opinion as to when the restraint of Mr. Floyd should have ended in this encounter? Yes. What is it? When Mr. Floyd was no longer offering up any resistance to the officers, they could have ended their restraint. And that was after he was handcuffed and on the ground and no longer resisting? Correct. Thank you. Uh, I have no further questions, Your Honor. Ron Kuby, what does this prove? Does this prove any element of the crime that he's been accused of? Does this prove a state of mind? What does this piece of evidence go towards? It, mostly what it does is it disproves the notion that Chauvin was acting in accordance with police procedure. There was other testimony about that today as well. But, but killer cops will frequently hide behind I was following procedure. That's what I was doing. And in this case, um, his most immediate uh, superior on the scene said, no, that simply isn't true. That's why the end game here is the lowest possible charge of conviction and a reduced you know, or a, a guideline sentence rather than not guilty or walking free. Lisa, let me ask you, what do prosecutors argue as a result of this evidence? Uh, OK, he's not following police procedure, but how does that equal... How does that play into murder, whether it's second degree or third degree here? So when I'm trying cases, I have a closing argument folder and I make notes throughout the trial and I put it in the closing argument folder. This would be starred in my closing argument folder that his own supervisor said it was not reasonable for that knee to be on George Floyd's neck after he stopped uh you know, after, after he was no longer resisting. I don't think he was resisting at all at any point, frankly, but clearly there was a point uh, well before uh, the death of George well, Floyd, Let me ask you, Lisa, minutes later. Does, does that prove the negligence, which is the manslaughter? Does that prove uh, the, the intentional assault, which is second degree, or is it the oh, depraved I, I, mind in the middle? Uh, I think it was an intentional assault. I think that Chauvin got very revved up and felt that he had to put George Floyd in his place. I also think racism is a big factor in this case that nobody wants to talk about, but we should be talking about. And well, I think Ron will talk about it, don't worry. Well, and I think that continuing to have the knee on the neck 
when George Floyd was entirely motionless, threatening bystanders with mace, and not even taking his knee off his neck when the paramedics arrived, I think that shows the intent that is necessary for murder. I mean, I would be the last person on earth to discount racism as as the cause of George Floyd's death, as it has caused the death of so many unarmed and otherwise innocent African-Americans. I would be the last one to argue that a white guy under similar circumstances would have been treated in the same fashion. But what did get established in this case, uh, and I think what we heard from Derek Chauvin in the in the body cam footage is the only thing we're going to hear from Derek Chauvin in the course of the whole, tri- the whole trial, that number one, he's trying to control the guy who's struggling uh, to avoid being put in the patrol car. And number two, he appears to be high on something, and indeed he was. That goes a long way toward negating the idea that Chauvin comes into this encounter with some sort of depraved evil heart, even though we know he's a white cop and, you know, probably did. Wow. So, Lisa, I'll give you the last he, word. Go ahead. Of, co- of course, Chauvin's not going to make racial comments. He knows he's being recorded. But we know that implicit bias is real, especially in white people. About 80 percent of white people test for moderate or severe racial bias. We know that police have to be trained to get rid of racial bias. And how it plays out with white cops is they over uh, they overestimate the threat from a black person, especially a large black male. And that's what happened here. And I do think that if this was, there's no question in my mind, or I think in the millions of Americans who took to the streets after this, that if George Floyd had been white, this not would have happened. The knee would have come off the neck much sooner, well before death. Lisa Bloom, Ron Kuby, always great to have you on. Please come back soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good to see Thanks, you, Ron. Ray. Yeah, you too, Lisa. You're looking good. There you go. Look <laughs> at Ron. He's, he's un- unbelievable. All right, folks, still ahead. 